When Portal first released, it was considered a spin-off or add-on to the much-loved Half-Life series. Valve debuted the game as a part of the Orange Box, alongside Half-Life 2, its expansions and Team Fortress 2. Through word of mouth, a buzz built up around Portal's concept and near flawless puzzles. It felt like something absolutely new and its twisted approach to physics caught on in a big way. The title's villain, GLaDOS, quickly entered the public consciousness as a hilariously sinister character and fans were soon aching for more of her sardonic wit alone. After a four year wait, Hopes were answered, and then some, with 2011's Portal 2. The puzzles were bigger and more ambitious, and GLaDOS returned in full force with a host of original characters in tow. Its popularity was such that demands are still made in 2018 for Portal 3. The community-based perpetual testing initiative, which allows players to create their own puzzles, did its best to quell those demands, but nothing can truly match the integrity that Valve brought to every department behind the scenes of Portal and its sequel. The audio for series sounds like an organic part of the stellar art design, underscores the humour of the writing, and gives the puzzles enough room to breathe. For Portal, Half-Life's excellent composer, Kelly Bailey, submitted tracks alongside Mike Muraski, a true renaissance man who helped craft visual effects for both The Lord of the Rings and The Matrix trilogies before writing music for several of Valve's games. Mike's work in bands like Steel Pole Bathtub dates back as far as 1986, and his art rock background still influences his style today. He took on the score for Portal 2 on his own, which he weaved into a subtle, multi-layered narrative with a literally operatic climax. I'm Lee Tyrrell, and this is The Sound Test, where I look in-depth into video game audio and music, along with the very people who crafted it. For this second triple-stuffed episode of the series, I spoke to Mike Muraski. Hey, how are you? The songwriter of both releases end credits tracks, Jonathan Colton. Hello. And GLaDOS herself, Ellen McLean. Hello. I was unable to get in touch with Kelly Bailey for a conversation, but his ambient synthscape set the tone of Aperture Science's opening test chambers. Mike was mostly responsible for the second half or so of the score, which centers around your escape attempt. Without Kelly himself to comment, I asked Mike how he felt about his colleagues' contributions. What Kelly had done for the first part of Portal, I thought was genius. Like it really, A, it's, you know, it's the Half-Life universe and Kelly's sound is pretty synonymous with that. Um, but that sound was very, like this kind of dark turn on an Eno-esque, you know, sort of ambience. You know, everybody's got different ways of holding music in their head. And some people are super, like, uh, literal and explicit about, you know, they hear literal notes in their head. And, and I, I have that uh, as part of my mental makeup. But I also have this other weird way where it almost is, in my brain, is represented as uh, almost impossible to describe, but like a, like a colorful sculpture um, that moves through time, kind of. What he had created in that context really fit with the graphics in my mind. The minimalism of Kelly Bailey's music for Portal underpins the player's growing unrest. It's clean, clinical drones put up a musical mirror to the test chambers in their initially sterilized atmosphere. As your tormentor, GLaDOS, slowly shows signs of her madness, it's the music that makes your situation all the more terrifying. Mike has commented in several interviews about the difference in Kelly's work to his own, 
and how Kelly's evokes the sound of the future as it's presented in pop culture from the 70s. In contrast, Mike moved the ethos into the 80s by toying with the tropes established in films like Blade Runner. In the context of Portal, the transition highlights a change in setting as you flee into Aperture's workings. I was looking at it and looking at the, you know, because you go from sort of these white, clean uh, puzzle spaces to the behind the scenes where everything's kind of rusted and broken and the future is not all that great and it's threatening um, and pretty much on the surface. And that to me really rung of, you know, sort of the 80s future as opposed to the you know, 70s future was sort of this like even better than the 60s future, you know, it's like this very utopic sort of vibe um, that is reflected in Eno's music and whatnot. Whereas the 80s was very much Blade Runner, you know, and sort of the beginning of this idea that the future was very dystopic and, and broken, you know, kind of the Brazil version of futurism. In the same way that Kelly's music was like a dark turn on sort of the 70s ambient music, um, I didn't want to just ape, you know, um, you know, let's say Blade Runner or whatever. Like it wasn't a total retro thing. It was more like taking the feel of that and that kind of concept of the dystopian thing, but then modernizing it. It's sort of this thing that I, I tend to do whenever I'm reaching back into like historical genre stuff, you know, because if you just ape it, then it's sort of pastiche. It was way more like, okay, what is the feel of Blade Runner? You know, what's the feel of that music and that, that the whole vibe, even just like watching the film, not just the music itself, but the experience of that 80s um, sort of feel and how can I recreate that but in a way that's a little bit new and fresh. True to Mike's intentions, Portal doesn't sound like Blade Runner, it sounds like Portal. Likewise, Kelly's music doesn't reference any particular material from 70s science fiction. But the same feelings come through. There's a growl to Blade Runner's score, which Mike captured and stirred into his own techniques. I do hear it. I hear what I was kind of going after. I think, you know, I moved to Japan in like 1983 and lived in Tokyo for a couple of years there and, you know, had a, a pretty complete MIDI electronic studio at that time. And so I'm pretty familiar with synthesis, like from a practical, you know, historical standpoint. Um, and yeah, when, when I took that approach um, in Portal 1, it's funny now that, you know, kind of retro synthesis is so incredibly popular. Um, but at that time, that's not really how I was approaching it. Although I did use like, you know, some FM synthesis and, and uh, you know, uh, a, a profit. Um, I love the Korg Monopoly, for example. Um, but really, I was approaching it way more from kind of uh, an aesthetic standpoint. You know, I was just kind of looking at some of those darker tones uh, in, you know, instead of kind of these clean, you know, like Kelly's stuff was a little bit cleaner, I guess, in a sense, and in, in not quite as, as dark in tone. And one of the things then that I added to that was um, 
sort of approaching more of the contemporary kind of glitch tools, I guess, for lack of a better term, that were becoming available right around that time. You know, um, Reactor is a, a, a big favorite of mine. It's got some really great manglers and, and you can kind of break it open and do just about anything you want inside of it, which is always really appealing to me as a, as a digital tool uh, creator and user. Um, and so I kind of explored it that way. So it was sort of more about like finding the feel of the 80s um, but then going ahead and using, you know, kind of more contemporary um, instruments to uh, accomplish that. After traveling through Kelly Bailey and Mike Muraski's music for Portal, the credits reward your hard work with a song. However, Neither Mike nor Kelly wrote it. Still Alive, featuring Ellen McLean as GLaDOS singing, was composed by Jonathan Colton, a popular songwriter with a penchant for amusing lyrics. All Portal fans know it well as one of the series' strongest musical symbols, but even those who haven't played the games likely know of its legacy. Jonathan's writing is as fun as it is sincere making it a perfect match for Valve's releases. So when I interviewed him over the phone, my first question was to ask how the two crossed paths. I was doing a show uh, in Seattle, and uh, Kim Swift, uh, who uh, was a fan, came up and said hello afterwards and said that she worked at Valve and would I be, would I ever be interested in writing music for video games? And I said, yes, of course. And uh, so, you know, sometime later, she talked to the bosses and set up a time for me to come out there and and uh, and go to the offices and meet with everybody. And that's when I discovered that she was the, uh, you know, she was the project lead on on Portal, which is uh, uh, at that point uh, there had been uh, a couple of teaser trailers uh, online, and uh, I was very excited about the game and. Got to got to play through an early version of it and uh, talked with talked with everybody there and um, uh, it was at that meeting that we sort of hatched this idea of writing a a song for Glados to sing uh, sort of in the tradition of musical theater. <laughs> this was a triumph. I'm making a note here. Huge success. It's hard to overstate my satisfaction. The seed of that idea would grow into what we now know is still alive, but there was some development needed. With a whole game stuffed with brand new mechanics, an existing soundtrack, and a fleshed out narrative to consider, how did Jonathan and Valve decide on what should be the song's focus? I spoke frequently with uh, with Eric, the writer who was, um, uh, you know, had a lot of uh, backstory for his own purposes on where Gladys had come from and who she was and why she was the way she was. Um, and, you know, we, we had many talks about her character and sort of what motivated her and what moved her. And, you know, from the first time I played the game, the voice of GLaDOS was such a compellingly written character because she she's complicated. She's emotionally complicated. <laughs> um, and she's annoying. She's an annoying personality. She's mean to you, you know, with, but she's mean to you for her own uh, reasons of insecurity, maybe. It's very hard to tell what's going on, but she, she's such a complicated and interesting character that we spent a lot of time talking about that and, and trying to figure out how to crack this nut of you know, what does it mean for a, a video game character to sing a song? And why would that be? A, why would a video game character sing a song? And what would it be about? And how might she be feeling at the end of the game? And, you know, what might she be thinking? But what might she also not be able to say? So um, we talked about it a lot. And I kind of I kind of wrote uh, a first draft and, and uh, sent it over and uh, it, was, it mostly remained as is. There, was, there were a couple of 
lyric tweaks here and there, but it, I think the, you know, the groundwork we did in talking about it in advance really sort of got us, got us all on the same page. Still Alive is a quintessential Jonathan Colton song, just as it's key to the Portal universe he wrote it for. He'd built up a loyal internet following before his affiliation with Valve. Still alive. So how does Jonathan usually construct his music? I am not one of those people who just writes prolifically. I have to decide to, to do it um, because I really do fear you know, the blank page and the, the part of the process where you you have the beginnings of an idea, but it's not any good because you haven't finished writing it. That's the worst part. <laughs> and I, really, I really hate that feeling. And I even though I know you have to push through, it's hard for me to uh, to force myself to do it. Um, so, you know, what I like to do when I'm writing is to find, you know, I sort of cast around with some musical ideas and kind of saying nonsense syllables and maybe come up with a phrase or an image that strikes me. And really the thing that always sets fire to it is this idea of a character, is finding a voice of a, of a, of a character um, that comes from some specific, interesting, complicated place. So, you know, I'm never, I'm never moved by... Um, a character who just wants to say I love you to someone that's not interesting to me, but it's some a, a character who who really loves somebody but can only be mean to them. That's a fascinating <laughs> like that I could really dig into that. You've been wrong about every single thing you've ever done, including this thing. You're not smart. You're not a scientist. You're not a doctor. You're not even a full-time employee. So you know, a lot of the songs that I've written are about kind of monstrous personalities, whether it's a, an evil genius or a, a you know, a, a, a giant squid suffering from depression or, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a sullen uh, teenager who fantasizes about creating a robot army to destroy the earth and enslave the woman of his dreams. You know, I, this, <laughs> these are all monstrous personalities, but I, I like to I like to find a character that has that kind of complicated interest and then try to empathize, try to sort of see where they're coming from and, and, and let them uh, explain and reveal themselves. So, that, so that's why, you know, it was such a perfect match because GLaDOS is a, is a character that's pretty similar to the kind of characters I write about all the time anyway. Stop squirming and die like an adult or I'm going to delete your backup. GLaDOS. Portal's brilliant antagonist was brought to life by Ellen McLean. Ellen is an actor and classically trained singer who provided voice work for other Valve titles like Half-Life 2, Left 4 Dead and Team Fortress 2. Her inflections are synonymous with Portal now, but early in the game's development her role was totally computer generated. In my conversation with Ellen, she told me why Valve went with an actual voice actor and how the character evolved through her involvement. Well, initially, uh, they just told me to sound as close to the computer-generated voice as possible. Hello, and again, welcome to the Aperture Science Computer-Aided Enrichment Center. Now, the computer-generated voice that they, when I did my audition, they sent me a voice file of a computer-generated voice, and they had planned to use that for the game, for Portal, until they realized that it was copyrighted and that it was cheaper to hire an actor to do it. And, and then they also realized that, you know, in the beginning of the game, when you think that the computer-generated voice is just the prompt, you know, it's easier to do that, but as Portal continues and you realize that the computer is kind of crazy, then it became more important to have a more flexible 
quote unquote program. I let you survive this long because I was curious about your behavior. Well, you've managed to destroy that part of me. So they realized that for, for that reason as well, that it would be easier to have an actor do GLaDOS because the actor could get more emotion into the voice that sounded like a computer. And then of course, uh, in the game, when GLaDOS loses the morality core, um, she becomes amoral and 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 they wanted me to change the voice again so harder to do with a computer generated sound than with a real person and bottom line cheaper cheaper to do with a real person killing you and giving you good advice aren't mutually exclusive as if one legendary character weren't enough Ellen lent her talents to Portal's entire cast of turrets. Hello. The closest thing to a dynamic enemy in Portal, except GLaDOS herself, the turrets were an ingenious way of sprinkling extra danger into later test chambers. In their interactions with you, the turrets are polite, friendly and cute, comically opposite to the unrelenting bullet sprays they fire at you on sight. Unlike GLaDOS, you get a real sense that beneath it all, they're just good-hearted slaves to their own programming. During production, Valve were less certain on the right direction for the turrets, so Ellen was given freedom to experiment. I was in the studio, and they were literally asking me, I mean, they were on the other side of the glass, you know, using the button to talk to me in, this, in the, you know, the uh, studio where I was behind the glass. They were just asking me to try different things. And I thought of the turret voice as, as really sort of a little chipmunk voice. Coming through. I, I thought of it as a little animal. And when I did that, it was like, oh yeah, that's it. That's the turrets. <laughs> so, you know, these things came up through me, but then were okayed by, you know, the producer Bill Van Buren and Kim Swift and Eric Wolpaw, the principal writer, you know, of Portal. And uh, so, so it was, it was a group effort, you know, sort of manifested through my voice. I don't hate you. It's all too often forgotten about that Ellen also voiced two of the personality spheres you have to incinerate to defeat GLaDOS. The cake sphere reads from a surreal list of ingredients in a deadpan monotone. One cup lemon juice, alpha resins, unsaturated polyester resin. Bursting with childlike wonder, the curiosity sphere questions everything. What is that? Oh, what's that? What's that? What is that? Oh, that thing has numbers on it. Interestingly, the third personality sphere, the anger sphere, owes its snarling petulance to Faith No More's Mike Patton. <laughs> Ellen showcases a mastery of her vocal talents in Portal 1, let alone its sequel, despite a background in more traditional stage acting. When one is on stage, one can utilize one's whole body to tell a story. And when you're voice acting, all you have is your breath and the sound that your vocal cords make. So that's, that's why I think of it as unadulterated acting because you can't, you can't do anything else except use your voice. Neurotoxin. <laughs> <laughs> so deadly. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> I'm kidding. When I said deadly neurotoxin, the deadly was in massive sarcasm quotes. I could take a bath in this stuff, put it on cereal, rub it right into my eyes. Honestly, it's not deadly at all. To me.
Ellen truly excelled as GLaDOS, and would do so again for Portal 2. Though we do see GLaDOS, her impact comes utterly from Ellen's nuanced performance, which we'll come to explore more later in this episode. Aside from Portal's dialogue, Jonathan Colton's Still Alive presents a chance for her to show a tuneful side to the character. It was pure luck that Ellen had all the training necessary to sing it at a professional level, and the quality of the results would eventually lead to a mini music career of sorts for GLaDOS herself. They had me record the song at the end by Jonathan Colton. Uh, Kim Swift and Eric Wolpaw were both big fans of Jonathan Colton, and they had wanted Jonathan to do something for Valve. Didn't know what. But, you know, since uh, Portal had such a tiny budget, as far as uh, video games go, they thought, oh, let's get Jonathan to write a song for Portal. Well, they had never heard me sing, Never, but they had Jonathan Colton write a song for me to sing. The first time anybody heard me sing was the day I went to the studio to record Jonathan Colton's song. <laughs> and, you know, it was, they, I had said I was a singer, so they believed me. You know, I, I don't think I met Ellen until the the day she recorded the vocal for still alive and uh and, you know that but they had told me they had said oh she's actually a classically trained singer so I, she she should you know she'll be great so i was like all right and you know i sort of wrote um wrote uh, without too much thought to her capabilities just sort of assuming that she could do it and you know from the the important thing to me was that you know judging from the the voice of Gladys in the game that she had a lot of great uh, voice acting ability, um, which is you know important when you're delivering a vocal and especially when you're delivering a vocal as part of a kind of you know musical theater like song. Um, uh, you know she is able to convey really subtle shades of, of sarcasm or you know pseudo disappointment and and sort of barbs and she's really great at that and i i was delighted that you know when i when i went into the studio to record her vocal they had some pickups of dialogue that they wanted to do first and she did them and i was i was amazed at how much of glados was actually there before they uh treated the vocal uh that it was just you know it's that thing where you hear some, you hear somebody's voice that is a famous voice and, and you say oh my god it's that person <laughs> I had a similar reaction when I spoke to Ellen, who couldn't have been more different from the insecure and controlling character she portrayed. Because of GLaDOS, and indeed the entire glorious package of Portal, the internet exploded with love and praise, overloading with the cake is a lie memes. The lyrics of Still Alive tentatively suggested more to come and the short runtime of the game made it feel like a first experimental step towards something more grand. Portal 2 proved those instincts right, scaling up everything about its predecessor and dropping its own inventions into the mix. Kelly Bailey left Valve in order to concentrate on his own projects just a month before Portal 2. It's interesting to imagine what he might have brought to the sequel, considering the gorgeous music he wrote for the first instalment. But Mike Moraski was still on board, and instantly set to work on an elaborate soundtrack of considered complexity. I was involved with the Portal team pretty early on, um, and we, you know, consequently I got to try a lot of things. I, the way I tend to approach these is I, I look for opportunities in the game as it's developing um, to add music or um, try and develop the brand, right? Like the, the, I, I'm looking at lots of different aspects to it so I can hopefully create the most holistic approach, um, which for a couple different reasons, I mean, there's the brand and the aesthetic that you're going after. Um, as well as just making 
your life, like not painting yourself into too much work, you know what I mean? Or into something that you can't uh, follow through on just from a, a development standpoint. And so uh, pretty early on, I, you know, the, the opening to Portal 2 was pretty similar almost through its entire existence maybe not entire existence i mean there's all kinds of really early versions of portal 2 that had nothing to do with what portal 2 eventually became but um there were you know the, that that kind of opening sequence where you're in the bedroom with the box you know that turns out to be a box was there and so i also like to look for um that sort of scenario that i can use as a test space for kind of branding um, as well as like a trailer, for example. Anyway, so I, I was running through, you know, just a long series of iterations on that opening sequence, and I just put it in the game and kind of see if people react to it or if they don't, um, you know, and, and also just see how I feel about it the more I play it. Um, and at one point I kind of hit on a nice, uh, a nice feel. I'm sorry, I'm kind of turning this into a long story, but um, I'm a pretty big Thomas Newman fan, and also just a fan of like Lydian modes in general, which I don't know if you're a music nerd, but it's sort of a thing that Thomas Newman uses quite a bit of, and it creates kind of a cool otherworldly feel. The precise definition of a mode is difficult to pin down in words, even for many musicians, but they're basically scales, or sequences of notes, that create a huge variety of feelings when played. A Lydian mode sounds something like this. It has a bright and almost playful feel, coming from the fact that it's a modified major scale. But its use of an augmented fourth, historically known as the Devil's Note, gives it an odd dissonance. I had kind of come up with this this piece that I thought really resonated with the game. What what I was playing to in that context, you know, with this kind of more upbeat, quirky vibe, was Wheatley, right? Um, as a as sort of this goofy main character, um, and the writers came in and were like, "Look, that's a really great piece of music, but you can't, you know, don't put a hat on a hat." as the, they say in the film industry, like Wheatley's funny, um, but we need the music to kind of be more of a straight man so that uh, Wheatley has something to play against. And so, which totally, I totally got it. The second they said it, I was like, oh, right. Like Wheatley's not funny if the world's funny. Wheatley becomes really funny if the world's really scary and dark, right? Without the various modes and scales available to composers, music wouldn't be able to convey the limitless emotions it stirs in us. At their absolute simplest, the modern major scale is said to denote happiness, while the moody minor scale soothes our blues. Within those base scales, modes hone in on even more specific feelings, but you can also ignore the rules completely and write atonal melodies tunes that aren't penned in by any preset structure. For Portal 2, Mike took a lot of time to construct a musical substory that intuitively progresses through more and more intricate scales and modes to a triumphant conclusion. I had been sort of working on this concept that the natural state of things was like a major scale or, you know, I mean, kind of this, this nice, happy thing, like, you know, all the, the weeds and, and jungle had kind of overgrown the lab. And so all the music would be of this sort of goofy, upbeat thing. But as, as it progresses and becomes, goes back to being aperture, it can shift into a darker, like darker modes and feel. But I turned it on its head and was like, oh, okay, so maybe nature is actually just has nothing to do with more the more complex modes of music and 
that maybe it's like right out the gate, nature doesn't even have pitches, you know? And then if it does have pitches, it's atonal, right? And as the lab comes back online, you slowly, the modes shift and you get things like, um, you know, uh, diminished scales and minor scales and they become more complex over time. Um, you know, eventually landing on a major scale, which is sort of the end of the game. Surprisingly, advancing scales and modes are just a single facet of the soundtrack's scaffolding. Spurned on by his reactive, generative music for Left 4 Dead, which has an episode to come in this series, Mike began to incorporate the same line of thinking. As I kind of thought of that as the environment reflecting the music as opposed to the characters, that's when I started to go, oh, okay, so how, you know, we're going to move through these puzzles and through these spaces. How, what, what is in those spaces that the music can be reflective of, right? The obvious thing uh, that came out, which also uh, was part of another line of thinking, was the, the puzzles themselves, right? And that other line of thinking was something that we had talked about pretty early on in Portal, which is um, at one point, I think Josh or Gabe, somebody was suggesting that the game should be like a rhythm, you know, like a, an actual rhythm puzzle game. I think we pretty quickly decided that that was a little too much to put on the plates of the level designers to have to work around. And we had figured out kind of what the game was going to be anyway. In Left 4 Dead 1 and 2, the music, kind of one of the main things we hit on there and really worked and resonated was that the music represents the game state pretty explicitly, you know? Like there's almost no music in that game that doesn't represent some sort of gameplay data. Almost all of it's useful in some capacity to playing the game, even if it's a little backhanded and misleading. It's always telling you something that, if you're paying attention, you can learn and use. Left 4 Dead's music is a key part of the gameplay, helping to warn you of nearby foes like the Chilling Witch or Barbaric Tank. It gives you a heads up and time to collect your wits for a hard fight. Applied to the calmer atmosphere of Portal, could generative music carefully guide the player through puzzles? It had proved to be essential in Left 4 Dead, whose special zombies are much harder to beat without musical cues. We tried a version of that concept, or a few versions of that concept in Portal, but the thing we discovered pretty quickly was that the real payoff in Portal is that juxtaposition to the struggling with this seemingly disparate set of facts or, or, or uh, elements in the puzzle that is your brain is trying to co make cohesive, you know? Um, and then that moment when they do co cohere and become sort of the solution, that aha moment, that's the payoff, right? It's that juxtaposition of the challenge to the, the eureka moment. By trying to lead the, the puzzle solver to the solution with anything other than the puzzle itself kind of robs them of that moment a little bit and lessens the impact. Like, you know, it kind of be this thing of like, you know, you're just kind of sniping at them with music, like, no, no, the answer's over here, over here. Uh, oh, I see, right? Like, oh, I get it, okay. I, you know, like I'm not actually solving the puzzle. What they're realizing is that the game's kind of, kind of nudging them to the solution. That idea of gameplay representation in the music kind of wasn't going to work. 
those two things kind of came together at the same time, this idea that the music should represent, you know, from an aesthetic and, and storyline standpoint, should represent the environment, um, as well as this other component of, you know, how do we involve the music in the gameplay um, and make it interactive. I mean, it is a game after all, it, you know, but we can't really do it in this other way. We kind of hit on this thing where I started to put music to the individual elements of the game. Let's say there's a, you know, a little spinny thing that has the laser or whatever. Let's say I put some rhythm component on that thing and I tested it out pretty early and it seemed to be really effective. It was a neat approach just from a, a musical standpoint. It's a good excuse to put it in the game and it sort of brings each all of these uh, characters if you will like it, it turns these simple mechanics of the puzzles into almost characters the test chambers of portal 2 seem to have acquired sentience since their appearance in the first game they rush and struggle to reconstruct themselves in time for your arrival, and continue to twitch in the background as you solve them. For Mike, the more natural life of the chambers themselves jumped right out as an effective spark for his composition. There's that panel in one of the puzzles that's juggling, you know, a, a cube, right? The second I saw that, it all kind of started to congeal that the whole thing's run, built and run by, you know, GLaDOS, this AI, who's also created, you know, these spheres, these personality spheres who are AI, essentially. So why not make it so that everything in the entire place is an AI, right? Um, which is sort of what Richard had done with the juggling cube thing. Um, and I sort of really then took and ran with uh, across the board, you know? So the the laser things, our characters, uh, everything, right? Like the faith plates and there's even, you know, when you trigger a faith plate and go flying through the air and you kind of fly past some music that's in space, you know, we had a big conversation about that at one point, like, that's not real. Well, the whole place is AI, right? So. Maybe, you know, there's some AI that y you can't even identify that's, you know, up in the air, right, in space. Because the way GLaDOS speaks to you, she's speaking into your head, yet her voice has the reverb and the, the ambience of the space that you're in, right? So it's a really, there's a bunch of kind of odd devices that we use in there anyway. Portal 2's official soundtrack CDs are credited not to Mike Muraski, but to Aperture Science Psychoacoustic Laboratories. For me, this backs up the feeling you get in-game that the music is coming directly from a specialised music department within Aperture itself. There are plenty of instances where more traditional scoring takes over, but the majority of Mike's composition for Portal 2 has a flexible edge that's extremely well suited to the medium, story and gameplay experience. At the end of the day, you have music that's representing the space you're in, which is threatening, right? Um, which kind of gives a nice juxtaposition to the humor of Wheatley. Um, and, you know, ties in with the sort of evil nature of GLaDOS. Um, you've got this sort of character aesthetic that goes with all the different mechanics and, and pieces of things that are functioning in the puzzles, um, which, you know, sort of gives you an excuse to give each puzzle an area sort of some music and a feel to it, um, as well as you're representing the gameplay uh, and the player's progression through the success of the puzzle, right? And that was sort of the neat byproduct of approaching it that way, was that instead of having the music lead the player to solve the puzzle, 
the player solving the puzzle rewarded them with a progressing, more complete uh, and more complex and more interesting piece of music to enjoy. It also like worked really in line with something I'd done in Left 4 Dead, which uh, I continue to always explore and, and enjoy, which is having music come from a location in space uh, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with, like, say, a radio or you know what they call source music in film. It's sort of this other idea that music's coming from a character, or you know, there's this other sort of thing that you can't. I, I suppose you could do it in film, uh, you know, it's sort of more of an operatic technique in a way, but even in opera it's sort of part of the dialectic where it's coming from the, the director as opposed to literally coming from the character. Deliberately and approached with care, Mike's soundtrack for Portal 2 can be listened to on its own as a clear concept album, despite its instrumental nature. Within, you can hear the development of musical themes, and then their destruction as they grow with the characters and story. Procedural elements give every playthrough different results, depending on your confidence with the puzzles, or will to explore. Instrumentation keys us into the game's timeline, as we tumble into the oldest areas of Aperture and back again. All those things kind of came together uh, in a holistic way that also led to sort of this overall sense that goes with the plot and the storyline that it's sort of this big operatic thing, you know what I mean? Where the, the music's coming from the characters, which is part of the gameplay, and therefore you've got these motifs that re represent all the characters, and by kind of tying back into the, my original music nerd thing by nature of the progression through what I'm what I'm in this context considering sort of a natural progression of of modes uh, in in a music theory sense also kind of moves you through this space in a way that that ties in with the storyline um, and so kind of at the end you, you sort of end up with all these things work together but that's that's sort of where the you know I, I know it sounds like I'm making it this holistic complex thing but we discovered each of these kind of components somewhat individually and I'm a total con you know art concept nerd too and so I'm always looking like how can I tie this all together in some way that will give it a holistic kind of design feel and concept and uh, and yet make it a game The first Portal's music had a narrative of its own, ramping up in intensity as you make your way towards GLaDOS, while tipping its hat to two separate decades of popular science fiction. We heard some of Kelly Bailey's contributions to that game earlier in this podcast, along with Mike's obvious respect for it. So was there any attempt made to reference it for the sequel? So there's two answers there, kind of, that are very related. Um, I tried pretty early, like very early on, to directly reference music from Portal 1, primarily Kelly's stuff, because there is that point where GLaDOS very first starts building puzzles for you, again, and you realize like, oh, she's going to A, fix the space, and B, she's going to put me back into Portal. I tried basically literally playing portal music, but in a very self-referential way, right? Um, like as a sample, like GLaDOS is doing it. Um, because that was sort of the, the conceit of this whole thing, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is that all the music is coming from the space or the characters or the machines in the space. And all the characters or machines in the space are created by GLaDOS. And therefore, all the music in the game is actually being generated maybe in an indirect fashion, but by GLaDOS, right? Um, and so trying to bring the music from Portal 1 in was 
weird because in part of one, the music wasn't representative of the space. It wasn't coming from the characters in the space. It was really a classic kind of the music is scoring the, it may be scoring the space, but it's coming from the creator. By trying to bring that forward into this new kind of paradigm of how I was doing the music, I couldn't quite figure out a really good way to do it other than to have GLaDOS kind of make a joke out of it, right? Um, and I tried that and it just, people didn't get it. <laughs> they thought it was really confusing. However, when you go back to the, the spheres um, and kind of work your way through the history of Aperture Labs, I was like, okay, so here I've got this situation where all the machines and whatnot, there's this kind of you know, conceit that the machines are all making the music and these machines are all old, right? Like everything's from the previous times and sort of my approach and choice of synthesis and the instruments I used were very much kind of based on this idea that they could have been generated by Aperture Lab scientists or by um, GLaDOS or really almost more interestingly, like by the things that GLaDOS had created, right? So these sub AIs, these little, these little kind of half aware systems. The section of Portal 2 where you visit its earliest incarnations is probably what differentiates it the most from its predecessor. Tight puzzle chambers are replaced with cavernous openings and spaces, a rusted and apparently endless scrapyard of the past. Bearing in mind that the sound of the future, as it was presented in the 70s and 80s, had influenced Portal, I asked if Mike saw the aerospecific spheres as an opportunity to continue that trend. So by kind of going back into the 50s, I definitely selected like say, you know, an electric piano, for example, a Fender Rhodes kind of thing. What was the technology that would have been available then that they could have uh, used to, to sort of give some musical elements to, to the instruments? And so I do progress it through, right up, you know, through that entire kind of chronological um, storyline but I do, I never really take it to like Kelly's version of it or my version of it. I don't know that we really, I mean, we do hit the seventies, I guess, in the storyline, but I just couldn't, it just didn't work with the sort of fiction that we had created, um, you know, sort of a sub fiction. And I, I just couldn't really kind of shoehorn those two ideas together. Fully incorporating Portal's own musical story into its sequel's soundtrack may not have worked out, but that's mainly because Portal 2 has so many threads of its own. Much of the effort and craft behind the soundtrack came directly from Mike, and he probably could have easily ignored many of the thematic beats he integrated in favour of something more traditional. Yet, the holistic attitude he brought to the sound of Portal 2 gave players a deeper impression of Aperture's mechanical madhouse. I think way too much. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, you give me a, an opening like, you know, Portal, which just, you know, a Portal 2, I should say, that just has so much going on. Um, and, you know, I, I can't help but kind of come up with all these crazy concepts. And, and, and they really do work, I think, just from a story standpoint, um, as well as an, ex you know, it's, it's, it's both sort of this, like, insane conceptual art uh, mentality that I have mixed with, uh, not a laziness, but I like uh, when I have some architecture to work to. Um, you know, I I played in rock bands forever, uh, 
And I really love that sort of pure art approach where you're everything that you're creating has no purpose other than you want it to exist, right? Like that's a, a, a way to make music and it's a really satisfying way, but it can also be incredibly frustrating and quote unquote muse oriented. You know, you're just waiting for like some inspiration to come along from somewhere um, you know, or you just work, you work, 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 and some things work and some things don't. Um, but when I'm working on a game or let's say some film or whatever, I really like to kind of think through the architecture and the scaffolding that I can hang everything on and to kind of, you know, at the end of the day, Portal 2 was, oh, you know, what, three CDs worth of material? It was a lot, a lot of material. And by kind of working out this huge conceptual structure, um, I was able, on a daily basis, to just sit down and plow through piece after piece um, and have it all kind of tie together and make some kind of sense um, and have some kind of cohesion because of that scaffolding and the skeleton that I had kind of come up with, right? Mike was heavily involved with Portal 2 from the beginning, like many of the original game's staff. The second outing featured a much bigger development team, but at the very centre were some of the main players from the first time around. No one can question that a truly irreplaceable personality to the series is GLaDOS herself, so Ellen McLean was naturally a part of the group. Okay, look, we both said a lot of things that you're going to regret. For Portal, most of the lines were written before I came on board. For Portal 2, I was in on it from the very beginning because my personality had infected GLaDOS so much that uh, the writers and the artists wanted to hear my voice from the very beginning. So all the lines that Eric Wolpaw and Jay Pinkerton and uh, Chet Falasek for the multiplayer game, all the lines that they wrote, they heard me say from the very beginning. And that influenced the way the game looked, and that also influenced the story, because as we were creating Portal 2, the, the story changed over the 10, 12 months that we were, you know, actively creating the game. Mike also discussed some of the growth that took place across the course of Portal 2's early development. He even explained some of the ways that affected his composition. For Ellen, changes in the script or story can have a profound impact on her performance and interpretation of the characters she plays. It absolutely affected me. And that's why, you know, they had me over, over that 10, 12 month period, they had me into the studio to record stuff at least every two weeks. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. I loved it because, you know, it was a character that I could immerse myself in and develop and investigate with, of course, all these other creative artists. And it was fabulous. It was, it was a, a high point of my career. Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. And I remember going to Valve when they told me I was at Valve for something else, but uh, Eric Wolpaw took me around the Valve studios and he showed me some of the earliest artwork for Portal 2. And you know, from that point, uh, where I first saw some of the artwork, they had thought to make Portal 2 a prequel 
a story that happened before Portal. Now, ultimately, in Portal 2, there are sort of flashbacks to before Portal, but it ultimately was not a prequel. Ultimately, it was a sequel, but with flashbacks. Those flashbacks take place deep below Gladys's labs, where Aperture of the 50s up to the 80s is explored with a new personality, Cave Johnson. Welcome, gentlemen, to Aperture Science. Astronauts, war heroes, Olympians, you're here because we want the best, and you are it. Human and showing it, with his drastic mood swings and gradual illness, Cave shows up through audio recordings with his lovely assistant, Carolyn. Yes, sir, Mr. Johnson. Though this is far from a spoiler-free episode, and assumes you've played the games, I'll leave some of the revelations around Carolyn to you, but it's a big hint that her voice was provided by Ellen. Carolyn's lines don't even come to a full minute when collected together, but Ellen's talent is such that a rich picture of the character is drawn regardless. Well, I thought of Carolyn as a sort of typical 1950s, 60s secretary. You know, bright, perky, uh, wanting to please, young, you know, much younger because I was, I was in my mid-50s when I was recording all of this. So I, I wanted her to sound young, innocent, and uh, perky and hardworking. Hardworking and available and, you know, always ready to go get a cup of coffee, always ready to do filing, always ready to do whatever the, bo the boss asked her to do. Yes, sir. So I, I have to say that any voice that I create comes from my inside feelings and then manifests into my voice, manifests through my vocal cords. But it's something that I have to feel in my gut first. Though GLaDOS is absent from much of this section of the game, she eventually reappears as a potato. Dubbed Potatoes, the once looming antagonist is a humbled, defeated husk of her former self. Picked at by birds, and without even the power to lie, her depression drips through her dialogue, twisting the dynamic to hilarious effect. I tried to get to my lowest point, most depressed, most de-energized, angry, hopeless. I was, I was trying to find all of those places in myself as I was potatoes. Also, realizing that it was incredibly funny, but as the character, you cannot think it's funny. It is not funny, it is tragic. You know, for the, for the player, one, one hopes it's going to be funny, but for, for me, as GLaDOS, it was tragic. Potatoes even has her own theme. The haunting and tortured Potatoes Lament. Of course, it's only one example of Ellen singing in Portal 2, but it's possibly the most unique. Its composition worked in a similar way to the famous turret opera, with Ellen improvising loose Italian syllables, which Mike would then take and adapt into an instrument of sorts. I love Mike's music and everything that he wrote for Portal 2. I loved singing and and of course you know one of the pieces that you you only hear at at I think one point uh, you know Mike ended up calling it potatoes lament and I think it is such a beautiful melody
Through GLaDOS, Potatoes, Carolyn, and the turrets, we hear the individual craft of each voice. As Portal 2 developed and made subtle tweaks to its story or structuring, how did Ellen stay on top of it all? And what kind of direction did she receive to make sure her portrayal was on point? The writers were always in the studio. They were all always on the other side of the glass. And the writers and Bill Van Buren would tell me what was happening in the game. And they would talk to me about what GLaDOS wanted, what GLaDOS was doing, or Carolyn, what was happening with Carolyn, or what was happening with the turrets. So there was always someone there to explain to me specifically what was happening to the characters I was playing. And Bill Van Buren had a great talent for if I said a line one way and it needed to be more something else, Bill Van Buren always knew how to choose his words so that it would communicate to me what the writers wanted. You know what my days used to be like? I just tested. Nobody murdered me, or put me in a potato, or fed me to birds. I've acted for a long time, Lee. I'm not always at my best. And I attribute it, when I am at my best, I attribute it to good direction. The creative team behind Portal 2 had a strict vision, but not so much that improvisation was thrown to the wayside. In his role as Wheatley, Stephen Merchant was highly praised for his off-script comments and ramblings. Had a bit of a brainwave, there I was, smashing some steel plates together, and I thought to myself, yeah, it's deadly, but what's missing? What's missing? And I thought, lots of sharp bits welded onto the flat bits. It's still a work in progress, don't judge me yet. Um, but, you know, eventually I'd like to get them to, to sort of shoot fire at you um, moments before crushing you. That's, the sort of, that's what I'm aiming for. Um, but, you know, small steps. Years of practice on the British comedy scene and essentially inventing podcasts with Ricky Gervais and Carl Pilkinson was perfect preparation for that. Ellen's lines were often more set in stone but there was still some breathing room for her own expression. Stephen Merchant and uh, J.K. Simmons are both fabulous at improvisation. So a lot of what they did was improvised. Me, they, they wanted a lot of laughter. And so I would laugh. And my, you know, just any kind of laugh I could do also, uh, Feelings of upset, you know, uh, shocked, gasps, etc. I also had to improvise. I remember that uh, they we couldn't record Happy Birthday because Happy Birthday at that point was copyrighted. Now, since that copyright has been released and Happy Birthday, the song is now in the public domain. But when we were recording Portal 2, we used the melody to For He's a Jolly Good Fellow. Of course, the other time that I was improvising is when I was recording music for Mike Moraski for the turret opera, and I had to improvise all my lyrics. And so I was improvising in my bad Italian and in my bad Latin. So all of those lyrics were improvisation. So <laughs> sort of how I can improvise, I did improvise. Since the turret opera is extremely close to the hearts of Portal fans, this podcast has a whole segment about its production. 
with thoughts from both Ellen and Mike. But before we analyse the turret's theatric end to the game, there's so much more to cover about the music of Portal 2. Motifs are put to powerful use, starting from the opening sequence with this cue. It shows up in other places too, and most incredibly, even other titles from Valve that Mike worked on. I definitely use it in TF2 and Man vs. Machine. It's sort of this representing of, you know, technology gone awry. In Portal 2, it's, you know, right at the very beginning, the second you, you realize that this Wheatley character is <laughs> not necessarily such a good guy. Um, you know, that theme just shows up right at the beginning, that little motif, and, you know, it shows up at the very end and, and in a whole bunch of places, and it shows up in other Valve games as well. I mean, there's just so many of them, Mike. That's the, the main one that just first came to mind because it is one of the very first ones in the game. It represents that idea of technology literally becoming a destructive force. Um, in the world and, and being dangerous, really. Uh, may, maybe inadvertently, but still dangerous. One of the less dangerous themes first shows up in Love as a Construct, a tune that seems to accompany the Companion Cube. It takes a step outside of Mike's musical architecture of advancing modes by leaping straight to the modern major scale. This is why Love as a Construct sticks out a little when you reach its test chamber. It's also why Caramir Adio, or the turret opera, feels familiar once you finally complete the game. Parts of it use the same melody as Love as a Construct, and it repeats elsewhere too. The one where you first come across the companion cube and I think at the end of the puzzle is when GLaDOS first burns it up. That's another theme that runs, you know, throughout. Um, it's not just the, the companion cubes or the, it's sort of this theme of, it's the love theme, really, at the end of the day, I guess. Um, and it's also very much in a major scale, right, which is sort of the most progressed concept in my kind of weird idea of <laughs> of progression of, of musical modes through the, the arc of the game um, is that this kind of major scale based thing um, is the most progressed and that, you know, the love of the machines for the player because the player is, is playing with them, you know what I mean? And also recognizes that they're not just sort of slaves to GLaDOS, but they're their own you know, the, I always think of the turrets as, you know, they're dangerous, but they're there to play with you, right? Like, they're always kind of apologizing and sort of, you know, like, they're, they're playing a game with you. And I remember uh, those light beams that you can walk on, right? It may even be in a line in the game, but they're, you know, they're, they're captured sunshine, right? Like this idea that uh, GLaDOS is somehow captured sunshine and, you know, what's more loving than sunshine, right? Um, and so uh, th that's why they get, you know, they get that same theme. Um, and it's sort of this idea that, you know, the companion cube obviously is the most loving, right, of all the things, uh, but it's not, it's not, just, it's not the Companion Cube's theme. It's this sort of more like the natural progression of all these things at the end of the day is the most te technologically advanced as well, is a loving place, not an adversarial place. And that that's, you know, how most of the mechanics of the world would feel about you because you're there playing with them. 
GLaDOS is your only real adversary or AI gone awry, I guess, or, or whatever. Motifs are mostly a film technique, used to help cue the audience in on themes and characters. They're just as useful in games, but there are many methods available to VGM composers that couldn't work in other mediums. As we've already heard, Mike was interested in music that literally came from in-game locations, their robotic inhabitants, or the movements and actions of the player. After all, Portal 2 is an interactive experience, and that's going to transform how its soundtrack is composed. When you listen to a score on its own, a film score on its own, it's really a really super different experience than, what, than listening to it in the context of the film, right? And in games, that's even more extreme because you know, when you're playing a game, you're experiencing the music uh, in the context of, you know, a screen that ostensibly is your window into your world that you're you have agency in, um, and the music can you know can represent all kinds of things like we talked about, like gameplay or the emotions that you're supposed to be feeling, which is often a weird one, I think. I think that's misused sometimes in games. Sometimes it's used to great effect, but it's very much more of a film concept. And in games, you might not be feeling the thing that they're trying to push you to feel. But anyway, the, the idea is, is that the, the sorts of perceptual input that are in a game are so different than in, say, a film. Um, and so I've really, I tend to spend a lot of time, maybe too much time, but a lot of time on um, really working to augment those. And that's why there's like music that represents gameplay data um, or music that reacts to the things you do, you know, that your agency in the world is a big part of how the music is created. Um, and along with that is sort of how the things function in Portal 2 as being coming from the characters uh, and, and the machines and whatnot, it really, uh, again, this thing that I w did in Left 4 Dead and, and shows up in Portal 2 is this literal, like the music's literally coming from these things in 3D space, and therefore your position in the world is sort of often mixing the music. For those listeners who don't work with audio, Mixing is that part of production that deals with the various volumes of different instruments, the effects applied to them, and their panning, or how far left or right they are in the stereo field. A mix of most music is usually definitive, but video game soundtracks can let the player control elements of it themselves. It memorably happens in Chapter 3, Test Chamber 10, where a track called I Saw a Deer Today can be played with and manipulated extensively. That piece of music comes to fruition as you solve it, and it mixes itself as you bounce through the space, right? And as you sort of experience the solution of the puzzle um, as a as sort of a physics, you know, first person physics experience, and that I thought was super successful and super neat in the context of the game. But if you were to just take that the out the audio output of that and listen to it on its own it really i don't know if lacking is the right term but it 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 loses all that important context of how you experience it so when it came time to you know god we released the game and people were just immediately asking us for the music um, and you know i think gabe even just said like yes we're going to make it free, available for free and so I was suddenly like, oh my God, I need to <laughs> actually make all this, you know, linear and accessible to, to people in the public. And, and so that's how we ended up releasing it in these different volumes is that I just couldn't get it all done fast enough um, to, to release it as one big collection right out the gate. So I went through and kind of did, you know, these volumes of it 
that ostensibly were, you know, at the end of the day, going to be about the right length for a CD anyway. The OST CDs for Portal 2 required a lot of extra thought on Mike's part. Pieces like Triple Laser Phaser are literally never the same on different playthroughs, and Mike said in other interviews that that particular track can play for thousands of years without ever repeating itself. The official soundtrack meant Mike would have to crystallise highly subjective music into final versions tailored specifically to enjoy on their own. By doing that, I, I went through and, and sort of arranged them in ways that sometimes were really reflective of the experience in the game and sometimes less so. Um, I, tr I think I tried to make it similar to what the experience in the game would be like, um, but at the end of the day, it just was like, is this a good experience just in its own, you know, in the medium that it's being delivered in and the context that most people will listen to that. Like there's very little other coherent uh, perceptual input at the same time. Right. And so um, I kind of needed to go through and do that. And it, it definitely posed some interesting problems. But then something like Friendly Faith Plate, it's super neat on its own um, when you're bouncing through space. Uh, but to make it an interesting piece of music, or at least as interesting as I think it deserved or, or could become, I, I needed to do a bunch of editing and, and go through and, and kind of make it into its own thing. Friendly Faith Plate, as it appears on the OST, sounds to me like Aphex Twin or other IDM artists from the Warp label, but never shows up in game with anything like the same arrangement. In Portal 2, it's treated as a recurring theme in the overall soundscape, accompanying your graceful Faith Plate leaps. The soundscape of a level refers to its noises and general underlying ambience, which blends together with Mike's music. They were put together by David Feiss and Tim Larkin for Portal's sequel, and the relationship between sound designers and composers is often symbiotic in interesting ways. In the CD version of Love as a Construct, uh, it opens with, you know, one of the mechanics in the game going, you know, right? It was not one of my sounds, that was uh, David Fiza's sound. And, and you know, a lot of these times, uh, a lot of times, most times, uh, Dave or Tim Larkin, who did a bunch of the soundscapes, would have gotten to the levels before I did and done the sound design for the mechanics or some soundscape. And everybody's a musician, right? And so, you know, I would, whenever I would start on a level, I'd listen and see if there were any kind of um, major ta tonicism going on, tonic, you know, however you say that, dominant sort of tonics um, happening in the scene uh, or even harmonies of any sort and make sure that I work to those, right? And to me that, like in that particular piece, for some reason, it really needed that particular sound effect to set the stage of the piece of music. There's sort of this this problem in in Portal where you have these big empty spaces and no real excuse to have sound of much any sort really, um, and so you kind of have to come up with these you know fiction internal fictions or conceits of of why there would be sound there. You can either view it as a problem or an opportunity, right? And I think most artists who work on soundscapes and and that sort of thing view it as an opportunity. And one of the things that can make it more coherent or kind of have a, a more kind of a, a stronger reason to exist is to make it somewhat musical. 
Without using any particular instrumentation or traditional structure, a soundscape can still have a key signature and a rhythm. It's a subconscious perception rather than an upfront melody or beat, but Mike paid close attention to the work of David Feist and Tim Larkin in order to better integrate his compositions at every level. Hopefully, people don't notice it, but in sort of their subconscious, the the musicality is lending a, again a coherence or sort of a good feel to it, right? It it makes the 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 space feel good or dark or you know light or whatever. Um, and so most good sound designers have a, a, a certain amount of musicality that they're bringing to that anyway. And so. You know, if I'm coming into a space or working in some space that already has a bunch of sound in it, I'm going to be sensitive to that. You know, I have ears. I'm a musician after all. And so it's pretty hard for me not to to respond to that. And I think it's more effective when I do. I think it's a interesting and really neat part of the collaboration of this particular art form. And, you know, working at Valve in particular, it's very free form the way we work. And I, I, I don't think it's unique to Valve by any stretch, but um, it is definitely a, one of the things I, I enjoy a lot. Portal 2's soundtrack is surprisingly collaborative at times, though always driven by Mike at its core. We still have the grandiose turret opera to cover in this episode, and more on Ellen's vocals for the game's closing scenes. She's not the only voice to be heard either. Ghost of Ratman is a really quite terrifying track, and the only appearance of the elusive dog Ratman outside of his hidden murals. In it, his heavily processed voice spouts frantic gobbledygook, which some fans have been obsessed with decoding. Hopefully, this podcast can save those mystery hunters some time, as I asked Mike directly about it, and if he's seen some of their interpretations. Oh yeah, they're hilarious. I love it. They're so good. Um, you know, I got it. That's Mark Laidlaw. Yeah, I don't know if I've told this story before. I probably have. Um, but uh, Mark, you know, basically kind of wrote all this gibberish, and... Um, and then just I, we just took him in the studio and recorded him like kind of crazily ranting this stuff, right? I, you know, I don't think it's pure gibberish. I'm sure he's saying something in there of, you know, he's pretty good at making sure he puts Easter eggs and all that kind of thing. And, you know, it is the Half-Life universe, which he created in, in, in large part. Um, and so there's stuff in there, but then I chop it up some, I don't, like rearrange it it's not sort of a, a William Burroughs thing but I you know I definitely run it through a hard tremolo uh, kind of again you know creating this I love that that sound of a voice through a hard tremolo which a takes out any sort of meaning to m most of the words but really keeps the feeling of somebody talking like it really keeps the, the feeling of the voice and it also just saved us from having to kind of write any other sort of thing that um, that, that the Rat Man would be saying. The theme that goes with the Rat Man uh, definitely follows the architectural scaffolding, you know, of the, of the music theory that's there. But the uh, he doesn't really play much. There's not. I mean, he shows up in a bunch of places, and that music usually follows him in those places. Um, but that thread sort of just is what it is, you know. The music theory of it definitely follows the bigger structure but he doesn't influence much else as we've teased a couple of times through this episode 
Mike's architectural scaffolding ends in the glorious opera of Cara Mia Adio. In its hugely memorable ending sequence, Portal 2 says farewell to the player through the surprisingly sweet tones of the turrets, who sing for you as you leave. Regular turrets, soprano turrets, and even the fabled Animal King can be seen in the game's final serenade, voiced of course by none other than Ellen McLean, who had already shown her skill with Still Alive. With its music composed by Mike from a set of Ellen's improvised syllables, I was able to get some background from both on its creation. By the time we got to Portal 2, they really did know I was a singer. And of course we had talked more and I had said, well, I'm an opera singer. Well, Mike Moraski totally believed me. And so he had told me that he had always wanted to write an opera. It was probably in concert with um, asking to record Ellen or to have me come in and work with Ellen to do the uh, Potatoes Lament or whatever it's called. Because she's a, you know, a trained opera singer, you know, and she's also the turret voices. And so I was like, oh, since we're going to record her singing for this potato thing, can we also just get her to do this limited set of, of um, syllables? maybe across a scale. I don't think I did it, maybe I did do it fully chromatically, but I had her sort of create a sample set of syllables that I could work with. I still have it, you know, it's a contact um, sample set patch of, of turret syllables. And I wrote like four, just improvised at the keyboard, you know, four different pieces. Um, one of which is that main theme that we end the entire game with. The first time I heard the turret opera all together, I was crying. I just, I, I thought it was so wonderful. I was just crying. When I first completed Portal 2, though I understand Ellen's tears, Karamir Adio left me with an ear-to-ear -ear grin. After the dark, tumbling modes of the preceding soundtrack, its major key melodies feel like a relief, and what better voice to hear as you finish the series than Ellen's? The level of detail given to the sequence through its animation is stunning, and Mike's use of established themes, like love as a construct, adds a pinch of familiarity. Interestingly, the ending centers on turrets and the ever-faithful companion cube. As opposed to GLaDOS, Wheatley, Cave Johnson and even Carolyn, the story only implies details about the turrets, who apparently have a whole culture of their own. Again, it was sort of like this idea that the game's an opera and that these characters have whole other lives that are separate from just how you interact with them in the world, right? That they're not just devices that are there to test you, which they are, that's sort of their job, but that's sort of like, you know, dogs fetching balls, you know? Like, dogs love to fetch balls, and it's sort of them doing their work in the world, but they have this whole other life and, and reason to be too, you know, which is their dog. And it's sort of that idea, right? That these, these machines have they are self-aware to a certain degree and therefore have other lives. And I didn't come up with this entirely on my own. I'm just augmenting sort of some of these ideas. The final opera is just one scrap of evidence that the turrets might be more than they're given credit for. An Easter egg in Portal 2, found by blowing up a vent with a redirected laser, reveals a group of them practicing their music, complete with a special, larger turret. There was this idea at one point that you kind of 
land in this world of castaway turrets that's sort of like a cargo cult, you know, that there's all these turrets that worship this one big turret, right? You sort of land in this world where there's all this like pile of turrets and they're all like worshiping the turret wife. Um, and so that's sort of where that idea came from. And we decided not to, you know, that storyline didn't actually make it into the game. But um, it did make it as this little sort of vignette, right, with the turret wife serenade, um, which again is one of these pieces that I sat down and improvised that first night with the sample set. And then it found legs with the animators. And there's still one or two other pieces you know, lurking back in my, my session somewhere that I'd improvised that night that just never found a place in the game or, or whatever. But um, it was sort of this idea that these creatures have this other life and somehow GLaDOS doesn't know about it, I guess. Um, and yet you do. You're sort of privy to this other, you know, world. The, the machines have greater dreams than just uh, torturing test subjects. But playing with the test subjects is one of the, the real joys in their life. And so, you know, that's sort of, again, this, this idea that you're privy to this side to them that is is special for you and special to them. From pieces that Mike improvised in one session, the turrets are given a kind of whispered exposure. Their society is left to the imagination of the player, who can use the turret wife serenade and Karamia Adio as a peek into what it might be like. As we've learned in this episode, Portal 2 was subject to a lot of change as it rolled towards release, and Karamia Adio was a fairly late addition. Though it doesn't seem it, the whole opera sequence was completed in a very short amount of time, brought in as a solution to some earlier plans falling through. You know, there was a point towards the very end of production where we realized that Jonathan Colton, who's brilliant and delivered a great piece of music with uh, Want You Gone, but he, he was going to deliver two pieces, and I had originally sort of said, like, look, if you want to just write it without doing the production, we can make that sort of this big ending thing. And we hadn't, it wasn't going to be turrets. We just didn't know what it would be. It was like, you know, um, I can figure out a way to, to score it into the game and make it part of the game if you want or whatever. And I think he was sort of a little overwhelmed with the idea of doing two pieces, especially since there was a lot of pressures because Still Alive was so successful. So he basically at one point is like, look, I'm just going to do the one, you know, I think the one is good enough. And we were like, that's totally cool. But so suddenly we were like, okay, what are we going to do for the end of the game? We were in the hallway and somebody said, well, let's just do a big giant choir of turrets doing, you know, singing that piece, but as an aria, like as, you know, sort of the big farewell. And so a handful of us just like buckled down and, and, uh, put that together in a few days, I think. To Mike, Karamia Adio was far from just some playful musical number to finish on. As with all of Portal 2, there are deeper meanings underneath, and the turrets aren't just singing because it's cute or funny. Of course, it's both those things, but it harks back to a suspicion that players have held since the first portal. It's hard to see them as heartless killing machines when they sound that polite, curious, and even innocent. So what does Karamia Adio mean to the turrets? When you leave, they're saying goodbye, you know, it's it's kind of this this thing of it not only goodbye, it's like the end of the game and and but they're they're saying, you know. They're saying goodbye.
As spectacular as the opera is, Portal 2 has more music up its sleeve before the end credits are done, and I haven't even mentioned the National's Exile Vilify, which can be heard from one of Doug Ratman's discarded radios. It hits you hard when you discover it, coming as an unfiltered slice of heartfelt emotion against cold, digital jabs. The same could be said of Still Alive, which ran over the credits of Portal and has a spiritual successor in its sequel. Want You Gone was also an original song by Jonathan Colton, who had the advantage this time of knowing Ellen's voice and skills better. I know that for Want You Gone, uh, I definitely was more conscious of her uh, range. Um, and I think, you know, I think when I wrote Still Alive, I wrote it in, the, in a range that I could sing and then had to transpose it for Ellen. And the key that she sings it in is actually a key that I don't remember specifically what it is, but it's hard for me to play in that key on the guitar. So I always just do it in my key um, when I play it live. But uh, yeah, for One You Gone, I, I knew, I had a better idea of what her range was. So I, I wrote in that key uh, that would work for her, which meant that when I recorded the demo vocal, I had to sing in a, in a high falsetto. <laughs> Want You Gone is a significantly different song to Still Alive, which was sweeter accompanied by acoustic guitar plucks and music box twinkles. For Portal 2, Jonathan played with another sound, so I wondered how the track was composed. I also asked how he factors arrangement into his songwriting, which may begin on a guitar or piano, but results in a completely electronic feel. That opening riff of Want You Gone, that one. <laughs> so I was working on an album called Artificial Heart um, that uh, uh, was being produced by John Flansburg of They Might Be Giants. And um, uh, in an effort to sort of uh, keep, me, keep me motivated in writing, he sent me a collection of um, little, little snippets, beats, beats and, and things, little snippets of music and I don't even know where he got them. I think he made them, or I don't know. But one of them was this extremely dumb... Dee -dee 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 -dee. And it sort of struck me, and I, I said, well, that's, I, don't know why, I don't know why I liked it, but it was a nice sort of planting your feet at the beginning of a song. And so um, uh, I grabbed that and started, um, you know, changing the notes around and and sort of built from there. Uh, so that's, that's where, that, where that riff came from. And, and, you know, in terms of transitioning from the writing part to the arrangement part, I, I usually find that I, you know, at a certain point when I'm writing, I do start pretty early on, I start hearing arrangement ideas in my head. I mean, I think it helps, especially when you're working on this, a solo instrument, like a piano or a guitar, it helps to know, to have some idea of what the band is doing in the background. And I, and I think you can write a song without thinking about that, but I find it much more helpful and motivating to think like, oh, this is, this is fast. You know, the drums are, the drums are really funky. Um, there's a lot of vocals, or maybe there's no vocals, or whatever it is, to have some idea of the arrangement. So those ideas sort of emerge as I'm, as I'm writing, usually. As the last musical statement of Portal 2, Want You Gone seems definitive. GLaDOS has grown tired of the players meddling, and spurned by Atlas and Peabody as new cooperative test subjects, doesn't have any need left for human victims. For years, Gladys' triumphant breakup song was the last we heard from Aperture officially. Fans slowly began to accept that a third portal would probably never see release, so 2015's LEGO Dimensions came as a surprise, bringing with it a level pack based on the franchise. The pack brings heaps of portal based content to the game, but its plot already featured GLaDOS in a prominent role, voiced once again by Ellen McLean. And let's face it, who could really replace her? I love the character. 
the character is me. <laughs> and so it's always fun to get back to a part of myself. You know, that very selfish, lonely, passive aggressive, hurt. I sort of think of, of GLaDOS as a hurt little girl. And uh, getting back to her is always, always satisfying. It's a part of myself that I don't, I don't visit all the time because I'm an adult and <laughs> I, I hope that I behave like an adult most of the time. But when, when I'm GLaDOS, I don't have to behave like an adult. Before you stands the pinnacle of your children's scientific prowess, the potato battery. If you'll excuse me, potatoes bring back bad memories. The only way that any game could portray GLaDOS authentically, and therefore effectively, is to hire Ellen. It may not have been a fully fledged portal game, but it's faithful and loving, especially in its end credit sequence. In a tip of the hat to both Still Alive and Want You Gone, Jonathan Colton was contracted to write a third song for the character, You Wouldn't Know. It's catchy, fierce and downright hilarious, bitterly painting images of GLaDOS and Batman sharing cake. Funny story, I forgot how much of a big fat mess you are. I've been busy doing science, it's been tons of fun so far. Everything clean, nothing on fire, all by myself. How does Jonathan think that You Wouldn't Know fits into the overall trilogy of songs? And was there any worry behind the idea of a return? I have been trepidatious. You know, sequels of things are rarely as good as the originals, and there, there is always a point where you're like, uh, maybe they shouldn't have made the ninth version of that movie, you know? Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I was never sure, I wasn't sure how the second one was going to go, I wasn't sure how the third one was going to go, but you know, again, I feel like GLaDOS is such a rich and interesting character that she's she's got a lot of different takes. Uh, she's got a lot of different places that she could be, and they're all they're all interesting. So, you know, I feel like um, still alive was <clears throat> was her, you know, pretending that that's how she had meant it to go all along, even though she was de defeated, sort of like talking herself into a into a kind of success you know that's the thing where you know the opening line this was a triumph the sort of the exact opposite of what has just happened to GLaDOS and then want want you gone there's a new emotional state where she's uh, you know she's kind of teamed up with Chell for a while begrudgingly uh, they've they've fought uh, someone else but uh, she ultimately decides that um, Chell is a problem for her, that she doesn't want her around anymore. Um, and this is where I started thinking of it like, like a, almost like a love affair. You know, for the third one, uh, it was, you know, a check-in call after a breakup. Just so you know, I'm not still upset. I'm, I feel great. <laughs> My life is good. She's hanging out with Batman. It's great. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, that was a fun that was a fun one to write. I mean, that was uh, you know the approaching it for the third time was definitely like, oh boy, are, are we really going to do this? Is this going to be any good? But um, you know the the spirit of that game and everything all mixed together was so exciting and interesting. And, and yeah, certainly the, <laughs> the idea that. GLaDOS could uh, name drop Batman was just too funny an idea to ignore. But you wouldn't know, would you? You wouldn't know, would you? Along with Still Alive, Want You Gone, and You Wouldn't Know, GLaDOS even has some unreleased material. I hoped you would wake 
like me, you won't say goodbye. Never say goodbye. Composed by Ellen McLean and her husband, John Patrick Lowry, also a voice actor for Valve, Don't Say Goodbye, or simply Gladys's song, is a totally different take on the character's feelings for the player. I could probably go back in my notes and, and figure out exactly when I wrote that song. Um, it was after Portal. And it may have been in the early stages of Portal 2. Because during Portal 2, uh, my husband and I did make a little home recording of it and we sent a sound file to Bill Van Buren and said, well, you know, maybe this could be an Easter egg. The song was first uncovered in an interview with Ellen and her husband, John, for Vice. Then, all that existed was a recording made on a phone, which the pair were less than keen to release. Thankfully, Jagger Gravenin, who wrote the surrounding article, was set on including Don't Say Goodbye in his piece. Finally, I said, well, I would want to do a better recording of it. Because literally, John and I were just sitting in the living room with his cell phone and made a recording of that song. And I said, no, that is not going up. That is not being posted. So Jagger, bless his heart, we went over to a local studio. John and I recorded the song so that I was satisfied. And then I let Jagger post that with the Vice interview. So that's why John and I had a decent recording of it. So then, you know, John put it on his, uh, you know, YouTube channel, Facebook page. I don't understand all of that stuff. And then ultimately, um, oh, the guy I love, uh, Harry UK. Harry UK did a uh, 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 animation of it and gladosified my voice. So that's the version that most people listen to of that song is, you know, not me, Ellen McLean, singing it, but uh, me, GLaDOS, singing it with, with Harry UK's brilliant animation of it. Brilliant animation. He wrote us, you know, he emailed us and he asked, he said, can I do this? And we said, sure. Go ahead. Harry 101 UK's YouTube channel sports heaps of original portal based material. Through his videos, fans of her don't say goodbye on a scale well beyond Ellen's bathtub where it was first written. I sort of think of it as my little song that I wrote in the bathtub. You know, John uh, realized it for me. Uh, with with a beautiful guitar accompaniment, and then Harry UK took it and 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 created this portal world around my little song. The deeper you delve into the music of Portal, the more impressive it is. It supports the narrative at every beat, but never sacrifices its own meticulous web of harmonic storytelling. The pop songs of Jonathan Colton are accessible hooks into the neuroses of GLaDOS, who gives Sephiroth a run for his money when it comes to villains. When we think of the Portal series, we think of Ellen McLean's voice, but we naturally hear it above Mike Muraski's resonant synths. Valve may have a reputation for being elusive and difficult, but their games set a new precedent for audio, 
which may have reached its zenith for Portal 2. There's as many theories to how Valve works as there are people at Valve, and even more so because everybody's got a dozen of them, and they're all unique and different. It's just, you know, a small group of people sort of trying to solve one really small specific problem and it turning into kind of getting a life of its own and, and becoming something that is special. The stars aligned with very talented people, Mike Moraski and Jonathan Colton, and all of the visual artists, and Bill Van Buren, and, and the writers, Jay and Eric and Chet, and it all just lined up, and my opinion, yes, I'm probably prejudiced, but my opinion is that Portal 2 is a brilliant game. Thanks to Mike, Jonathan, and Ellen for taking the time to speak to me for the sound test. But thank you too for taking the time to listen. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please make sure to subscribe or follow on whatever platform you might be listening on. There will be a new episode each week, with next week's inviting some previous guests onto the show. Both Danny Baranowski and Jules Conroy go over the history and development of Crypt of the Necrodancer's OST and its seven remixes. All of our Patreon supporters can receive early access for a single dollar, so head on over to patreon.com forward slash underscore secret cave if you'd like to pledge your support and hear next week's episode right now. Of course, this doesn't apply if you're already a patron and hearing this episode in advance.